going there, everybody? This is Samuel Fisher from Green Dispensary Marketing, back again with another guest. Uh, we have a very special guest today, and I'm really excited to talk with him. This is Jose Escalante. Uh, he represents a company called Futura Farms, Future Farms, it would be in English. Um, he's a cannabis entrepreneur. He's actually from Lima, Peru. Um, and he is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, Jose, he's actually the first person to receive a license in Peru for cultivating and selling medical marijuana. No, no, I'm not the, I, I'm not the first person to receive a license and I haven't, I don't have a license for cultivation. I have a license for import and distribution. Okay. So thank you for uh, clarifying yeah. that right from the get go. Cause that was actually one of the big questions I had about you. Um, but he's been very active with local politicians here in Peru. He actually introduced uh, me and my wife to um, a congressman in Peru uh, who's been making a lot of progress uh, with the laws in Peru. And he's got a ton of really great information, uh, informative information, informative content for us in the market of Peru and the broader Latin American market. How are you doing today, Jose? Uh, I'm very good. I'm very happy to be here, uh, Sam. Thank you for Thank you for inviting me. It's an honor for me. Yeah, no, uh, likewise. Um, it's been great meeting you, uh, learning more about you. Um, let's dive right, in, right into this. And so what are the first things, you know, when we're talking about the USA market, Canadian market, when they're talking about investing um, into the Peruvian, Latin American market, the first thing they'll be asking about is the laws. And so what do you think is the current political landscape in Peru and Latin America for cannabis? So, uh... If we're talking Latin America, I think it's very, very slow. Uh, it hasn't progressed at the pace we thought it would be. Uh, markets like Colombia are taking a little bit uh, longer than expected to regulate its uh, internal market. Their regulation, in my perspective, is more positioned for exports, uh, similar to Uruguay. Uh, the big markets, Mexico and Brazil, haven't progressed at all in, what, two or three years. So Latin America, it's a complex region. There's a lot of opportunity. Uh, once regs come into place, uh, there's a lot of opportunity, uh, but it's taken a little longer. Uh, markets like Peru and Chile uh, have been developing, in my opinion, quite faster. Uh, Peru, in specific has a great regulation. It's all medical, no no adult use or recreational, uh, only medical, uh, but we are allowed to do everything with a prescription and compounding pharmacy. So tinctures, edibles, topicals, vapes, extracts. Uh, the later regulation allows for flour. So in, in different uh, different products, you know, pre-rolls, uh, buds, uh, flour for vaporizing, and you just need a prescription. Uh, it sounds very complicated to get their prescription, but it's very easy. Uh, if you have the conditions, uh, there's no issue. You Physicians don't need a special license to prescribe cannabis. Uh, it's done very well. Uh, so I'm very happy with our with our local Peruvian regulations right now. Yeah, and given the broader Latin American climate, um, you kind of touched upon that. Like Brazil, for example, a lot of people have been talking about Brazil as like a big opportunity in the cannabis niche, cannabis industry. Also, Colombia. Um, what do you think, um, given the recent leadership changes, political climates in these countries? Do you think anybody's about to step foot full legalization here in Latin America? Uh, not in the short term. Uh, I thought Colombia with Petro was going that way, but and it's weirdly gone the other way. Uh, Brazil doesn't look that it's going to legalize even medical anytime soon, like fully medical with THC and, and everything. No, I, I, I don't see that. The Mexican law contemplates adult use but there's no regulations. Uh, it's all with, uh, what are they called, uh, amparos. Uh, so judges must give you the permission. Uh, Congress is not moving forward. They just changed presidents and there's a lot of political uncertainty. 
uh, Peru, uh, I think it's going that way. Uh, but still, I think it's going, we're three years out, five years out of, of having that. Uh, and well, we, we have Uruguay that is fully legalized. Yeah. Uh, but it's a small market, so we need we need larger larger markets to participate in the, the the adult use. I think Peru could be the pioneer and could lead Latin America and probably one of be one of the leading markets in the world uh, when talking when talking about cannabis. I mean, Peru is one of the most stable economies in Latin America. The our currency is very stable, uh, despite political uncertainties in the past years. Uh, the investment, the co confidence in investments and 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 consumers, uh, co consumer confidence is is growing. It's and it's very strong. We have an election cycle shortly in two years, but I see that Peru, if we continue in this pathway, we have the Chancay port and the Corio port in Arequipa. There are massive, massive infrastructure developments. Uh, so the economy is not going to slow down. I don't see it slowing down. So I see that if Peru aligns with markets uh, that are regulating that, like the U.S., for example, uh, there could be a lot of opportunity for product development here, exports, market, local market development, uh, exchange of experiences. Uh, uh, the U.S. has all these developed markets that have already done it. So there's a lot of collaboration to be done. I see it. I, 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 for me, the future is very bright, very bright. Yeah. So we, we actually met at a conference here in Peru, uh, the Andean Hemp Trade Summit. Uh, shout out to Chris Day, Global Cannabis Network Collective for putting that together. Uh, one of the speakers there, there was a man named Bo Whitney. I don't know if you remember him, but he was an economist. Yeah. And so he was talking about the opportunities that exist here in Peru. He made a, a comparison that I thought was really interesting. I'm actually from a place called Colorado in the United States. And he said that the market of Peru is roughly the same size as that market. So we're talking about billions and billions and billions of dollars in revenue um, just from that one state alone. And so it would be incredible if we could bring that over here to Peru. And so really kind of leading into my question here, what do you think is the biggest step that we need to make um, in Peru to reach that point where we have a full adult use market? So uh, the medical program has been a success in my opinion. Uh, my political, my, my political, my local uh, competitors and associates here don't necessarily agree with me. They see a lot of flaws in the regulation, as do I, but mostly the regulation is functional. And fun by functional, I mean, we sell product every day. Uh, there's a demand, there's a sustained demand that is growing at a slow pace, but it's growing. And what I think we need to develop the market right now is not necessarily the adult law, like right now, right now, what we need is to educate the people and to grow the medical demand and to capture uh, the legacy demand, the illegal, the illicit demand, to start capturing it. Uh, and there's still uh, the medical program I see it as, a, as a laboratory experiment of how this could be in scale when adult use comes, right? So if this is a success that continues to be a success for the next two years, I think we'll be ready for, for adult use. And we are starting to to push uh, forward with uh, some legislators and regulators to to debate the idea, to start talking about the idea of this uh, of this being true, but the market has to has to follow this. We need, uh, like I said before, uh, the main purpose of the of the event, uh, the Andean Trade Summit, uh, was to not only uh, attract economic investment, but also experience investment. People that have already done it in the States. Uh, I say that whatever happens in the States, five years later ha happens in Peru. Uh, so if why, why do I have to 
continue struggling for five years if you guys have already done it there. So let's collaborate and and make the market ready for our use. So this could be a really real hockey stick. And in parallel, uh, the hemp law will also help this because uh, the hemp law liberates, uh, for example, CBD products. Uh, people that need CBD for medical purposes will continue to go to the doctor because kids with epilepsy or people with uh, Parkinson's disease or cancer need to go to the doctor for their medication. That people that use CBD for to help calm anxiety, for example, don't necessarily need to go to a doctor uh, to consume CBD. And this will also the, the the liberation of this market will also help us educate the market, give us the resources to educate the market better. Yeah, but you think you made a great point. Uh, we, we have something similar in the United States called the Farm Bill, which is, is pretty much like the hemp law here in Peru, which basically makes it okay for cannabis seeds, uh, CBD products, anything with lower than 0.3 THC, I think it is in the Farm Bill of the USA. And it's really cool that we already have that um, here in Peru. Uh, but you, you mentioned uh, one of the big things that is needed is education. And so I'm, I'm really curious, um, you know, given, given an outside perspective, a lot of people kind of look at Peru as really – liberal for these sorts of things for example uh, when you come to peru you can get things like mescaline uh, you call it san pedro you can get things like ayahuasca you know these are really really powerful psychoactive substances whereas peru doesn't like cannabis at least not yet and so i'm really curious what you think we need to do on the education front to kind of put the cannabis plant in the same category or maybe a better category than these other substances that are already allowed and okay in peru so this is a weird point because mescaline and DMT uh, in the form of San Pedro, Huachuma, and uh, Ayahuasca are, I'm 95%, not 100%, but 95% sure they're completely legal, uh, but because of cultural reasons. So Huachuma uh, and Ayahuasca are like this for, form of duality in the... Uh, Peruvian, uh, like ancient Peruvian Inca, Precolombine societies. Uh, so they've been accompanying us for, for thousands of years. Yeah. While cannabis don't have that cultural uh, depth, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's it's different. If you if you take uh, take away ayahuasca. People will riot, man. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but 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 now that we have legal medical cannabis, if you take legal medical cannabis out or away, uh, people will riot also. So it's it, it cannabis doesn't have thousands of years, but has at least five hundred years since the Spaniards came, uh, if not more. Uh, so I think cannabis uh, is, is, is not that different. The thing is, cannabis has had all this terrible publicity uh, in the past 100 years that compares it to coke. And yeah. I grew up thinking that cannabis, coke, heroin, ecstasy, all that was the same stuff. Uh, so that's that's not the best reputation and uh yeah ayahuasca and huachuma don't have that reputation have uh, they have a good reputation here yeah that's interesting because in the united states would be the complete opposite where uh, right now cannabis is more of a good thing whereas if you were, if we were to talk about ayahuasca that, oh no 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 and then that's in super secret circles so i think that's a really interesting point how you're saying um, that they have a bigger cultural uh, depth and history in the country of Peru, and that's why they're uh, a little bit more accepted, at least for now. And so ho hoping that changes. Uh, but kind of moving forward, I, I didn't want to make this just about politics and Peru and whatever. I, I wanted to learn more about you, Jose Escalante, Cultura Farms. And so really, I, I was hoping that you could tell me a little bit about yourself um, and why you got into the cannabis industry. So it's a funny story. I didn't think I was going to come into the cannabis industry. I had a fintech startup that failed miserably. 
Well, let's hear a lot of, oh, I want to hear this story. What, what's this startup? What were you trying to do, Jose? Uh, we, we started trying to, so uh, when I went to the state for my MBA, yeah, you guys use Venmo and it works beautifully, right? Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I said, click Eureka, I, I'll make that in Peru. And when I came, Yape was already here, I was just <laughs> starting, but Yape was already here and said, shit, I have to beat BCP. That's going to be, uh, that's going to be hard. Uh, but I said, what the hell? I don't have anything to lose. So I started, but I, then I figured out you, you need over a million dollars. I, I remember of park capital just to get, uh, the license required to do that. Wow. And you'll be short of a bank. You'll not be a bank, but very, very shy of it. So the regulations were heavy, man. So we decided let's not start there there because we don't have that kind of capital. Um, and we decided to democratize the interbank transfers that are so expensive in my opinion is five soles to move money. It's if you want to move 20 soles, what the fuck? Uh, which now Yape has done, uh, thankfully. Uh, but at that time, uh, we're trying to democratize that. That didn't work. People didn't give a fuck. Pardon my French about no. paying five soles. <laughs> uh, they didn't care. So we started to uh, to lend money to do micro lending, right? Uh -huh. And that that went great, and uh, until nobody paid. <laughs> and we had a business. <laughs> and that's the story of, about my fintech startup that we failed miserably. So three years went by. We decided, hey, we, we need to put a stop on this. We've invested a lot of capital. We, we, we can't keep doing this. And then I was out of a job. And this guy, a very good friend of mine, uh, Eric, he was coming out of working for Canopy Growth here in Peru. He was... Uh, cannabis enthusiast and told me, hey man, I love the industry. I'd like to be in the industry. Uh, but I, I don't know the first thing about doing a business. Uh, you do, or why, do, why don't we join forces? And, and that's when Futuraka Farms came in. And that's how I ent ended up in this uh, roller coaster. <laughs> so interesting. So I'd like to hear more about Futura Farms. Um, can you tell me just to uh, give your elevator pitch or what, for the audience listening, what it is that Fukuda Farms does? Currently, we operate two business units. Uh, the first one is a uh, licensed distributor. We uh, import and distribute uh, cannabis ingredients, THC, CBD, uh, in different forms, isolates, extracts, distillates, uh, to compounding pharmacies. Uh, the compounding pharmacies uh, formulate this into final products and uh, make the dispensation. And we also run Organical, which is a digital marketplace in which you can get uh, medical consultation to get your cannabis, get your prescription, and buy your product. So that's basically what we do. We operate those two segments. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So basically you bring in the products, uh, you help people get permission to buy the products and then s sell the products to the people who will actually sell the products. And so a distributor might be the, the word here. Uh, as you've been getting started uh, and running your business, what have been some of the major challenges that you've run into along the way? Funding. Funding has been a challenge. I don't know how we've been able to pull through, uh, but that's been a, a, a challenge, especially the last two years in which cannabis, the cannabis bubble kind of sort of burst and funding went to zero. Uh, that's been an issue for us. Uh, then the thing in Peru is that nobody knows cannabis is legal. Getting the word out is very hard and you need a lot of uh, money for to invest in marketing and branding and all that. Yeah. Uh, so getting the word out, uh, working with regulators 
has not been as challenging as I thought to uh, I thought it would be. Uh, importing THC has been a pain in the has been a pain in the ass, but <laughs> but you know what? I understand it's a controlled substance. It's uh, I understand it could be easier. It could be easier. Yes, definitely. But uh, I I I like to think that we'll work with the regulators to make it easier as we as we go. Uh, I try to see them as our friends. Uh, I don't know if they see me. I hope they see me as their friend. Uh, uh, but I, 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 people see them as their as their adversaries, but they're not our adversaries. Uh, mainly funding. I mean, and, and I had zero experience when I started, so I I wasn't a regular smoker when I started. I am now, but uh, but I had I didn't know the difference when we first started. I didn't know the difference between cannabis and hemp, THC and CBD. What makes you high? I was very ignorant so now i don't know if i'm an expert but i i'd like to think so because i think of this 24 7 uh uh but but getting to know the industry how it works uh that's been that's been hard it's been super fun but it's hard it's been hard yeah and so um looking forward to the next five ten years what would what would you say your major goals as a company I think we need to develop our own production capacity. Uh, we are approaching the demand in which that makes sense yeah. as a market. I, I say uh, continue to importing goods. It, it makes it at least THC. CBD from the US is very competitive. The prices are very competitive. Yeah. So I don't expect until we have a local hemp growth, uh, I don't anticipate that. that that being that, that being so, but uh, in the cannabis, especially for especially THC, we need to grow it locally uh, and legally. I think I think that's not that's that's not impossible. I think that's very possible. We just need to be smart about it and don't overinvest because that happens. It happened in Colombia. It happened everywhere. Uh, but I think I think that's. Uh, more in the five year uh, range and in the 10 year range, we need to be exporting to the US. Yeah. Uh, I think I think that markets like Colombia, Uruguay are positioned and have been developing their, their the European demand. And Peru hasn't played that game, but nobody's played with the US because the, the US hasn't been federal. But we're close for that, at least the descheduling that will help a lot. Uh, so if we place clo play, uh, pay close attention to to what the U.S. will be doing in the next three to five years, and we model our regulations according to that, uh, like I said, I don't think we'll be providing the premium U.S. flower. That's so amazing, but we don't have to that's not the, the biggest part of the market. The biggest part of the market is uh, good quality to medium quality flour, extracts, distillates that could easily be done here with American technology, yeah. American American uh, knowledge, and do collaborations. Yeah, I think you brought up a great point um, about the opportunity for cultivating products here in Peru. Uh, just based on my experience, what I've seen, um, as, as you know, one of the big differences between a lot of American countries like Peru and the United States would be the economy. And so people in the United States are more willing to spend, you know, 50 bucks on a vaporizer that lasts a week. Um, whereas here in Peru, we're talking about a country where a lot of people are making $1,000 a month or even less than that. And so do you think if we were to start cultivating um, here in Peru, and um, I, I personally think we could do the same level of quality uh, in Peru that the United States does with just like the right equipment. Totally. Um, do you think that you would be able to really compete on a price level um, if we were to do that and cultivate here in Peru? Yeah, uh, before I answer that, uh, the, the reason I think uh, we wouldn't grow the premium U.S. quality flour is not because we don't we can't reach that quality flour. Yeah. It's because moving that from Peru to the U.S. will damage the flour and it would make no sense. Oh, uh, yeah, no, good point. 
Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I don't think uh, great THC flower uh, behaves very good under like container conditions, despite all the uh, temperature control. And I, I'm, um, I think it will suffer. Uh, not because we we can't get to that level. We definitely can, and we can make it cheap here. So to answer your question, I think we can compete in a price level. I think. There's uh, there's a market for every product and every quality. So if we want to compete uh, in in a premium level, say uh, nivel socioeconomico A, B, y C, uh, socioeconomic level A, B, and C here in Peru, uh, that's uh, roughly forty two percent of the population. It's and if if we take into account but with this data, there's around a million, a million point seven uh, cannabis users. That's a huge market. Yeah. That's a huge market. If we take into consideration the million point seven completely, we can make quality flour for everybody and price levels for everybody. So I think the Peruvian market, I, I, I don't think it's gonna be at the level of Colorado. I'd love to be, I mean, that's in the billions of dollars. Yeah. Uh, but I think the the proven market should be uh, between 250 and 500 million dollars in the long term. Uh, we should be doing that right now in the illicit market if we group everything together, Probably, right? Yeah. Probably. Yeah. So if we formalize that, I think we should formalize that and 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 help the illicit vendors, the legacy vendors. Uh, that dominate the demand right now that we should work with them and, and and with their regulators to see a way in which everybody can stay in the market everybody would be happy and and, and, and make that happen because i think the peruvian market is is fantastic for other products for other consumer products is fantastic people sell malls open every day in peru uh, stores open every day in Peru. Uh, if you go to malls in like La Comar or Jockey Plaza here in Lima, they're full all the time. So people buy. I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a matter of pricing. There's pricing for everybody. Yeah, I, I think uh, one one thing I really like about you uh, that I admire you is that uh, you you have a really strong desire to collaborate. I mean, you were mentioning how uh, personally how illicit vendors should be viewed as your friends as opposed to your competition and how, how politicians should be viewed as your friends um, and collaborations as opposed to your enemies. I really wanted to kind of shout you out on that. Um, so it's really kind of um, refreshing uh, that there's somebody who's not just trying to kill all the competition and be the best and the only one. And so it, it, that's something I really wanted to personally shout you out for, um, just kind of on a separate note here. Uh, but moving forward, I, I wanted to also ask you- Thank you, man. Yeah, wanted to ask you about marketing. And so you, you were talking about how it's expensive, and it is. And so I was really kind of curious what kind of strategies you've been using to kind of boost your visibility and get you up to the sales and uh, level that you oh. are right now. Everything, we've done everything. Some things work, some things don't work. I mean, we've been uh, putting out flyers, uh, we've been, trying to sneak around Meta to, to do some uh, ads on Instagram and Facebook. We've done the same in Google. Uh, we attend events. We try to do, uh, we've done billboards at some point. That didn't work because we didn't have the budget to do it long-term, so it didn't work. Uh, we've done, shit, I've, we've done everything. Uh, social is very complicated. Uh, you, you, you need a budget to access like the big, uh, influencers. So we've not been able to do that yet. Uh, but it's complicated. Marketing is complicated. That's why I, 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 I want to partner with American guys because you've already done it. The laws, the regulations, the rules of social media are very similar. Yeah. So I, I don't want to, I've been, it's been years going through that hustle. I, I'd rather partner up with somebody and, and, and share the business. 
Yeah, we, we had actually, uh, my wife and I, Juliana, we had some ideas. We were looking you up, and we had some ideas that we wanted to share with you, whether or not we're the ones who fulfill it and do the work. Uh, we, 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 have, we have some ideas that we're wanting to share with you, and we will share with you. Um, probably this Definitely. Week, please, please. It wasn't good at time. Um, <laughs> yeah. But moving forward, um, kind of moving forward, uh, regarding your advocacy role, um, and so you, what kind of role do you see yourself um, as far as pushing forward reform in the cannabis industry in Peru, do you kind of see yourself um, taking a more active role with congressmen and pre perhaps presidents or kind of sitting back? Or what kind of role do you envision yourself taking to kind of push the industry forward here in Peru? Uh, I think we need to, I'm not building an industry. I'm trying to build, I'm not being, building a company. I'm trying to build an industry and that's very complicated. Uh, hopefully, I have a partner, Raul, which is amazing. Yeah, great guy. And yeah, fantastic guy. And he likes all the public policy stuff. Uh, I, I'm I'm more of a sales guy, and he he takes on that, but he loves that. And he will continue continue to do that. Uh, we're now trying to uh, push the hemp regulations. In the best way possible, then we'll, we will probably focus on adult use. Uh, but it, it's it, it's not a matter of what I, I see Futura Farms doing. It's it's our responsibility as members of the industry to push this forward, because it's uh, it's in the best interest of everybody, of patients, of users, of uh, sellers, of pharmacies, of distributors, of everybody. Uh, of the government, of the police, we'll generate more taxes, we'll formalize, formalize a lot of jobs. So it's in a country as Peru that it's in development, it's our responsibility as business leaders to, to move uh, the industry in the direct direction that we believe it's best for the industry. So yeah. I, I don't know if we'll be able to reach president. That's a long shot, uh, but we've been able to build a good network, uh, and I think I think it's positive. Uh, the, the 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 output of regulators and legislators that went to the event was fantastic. Uh, everybody went. Everybody went. The Ministry of Health, the uh, the Ministry of Agriculture, uh, law enforcement, so the police, uh, uh, Congressman Alegría. That, that was amazing, and that shows the commitment that the government has to the industry. It's probably not the, 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 the principal interest in, of the nation. Uh, we have mining, we have uh, the ports we've, we, we've spoken about, uh, but cannabis represents uh, a huge opportunity both socially and economically. So, I think we have a responsibility to push that. And I don't know if I answered your question. Uh, yeah, you got it good enough. I actually kind of would lead into something else too anyways. Uh, but really kind of talking to investors, people who are interested in potentially getting involved in this Latin American market. Um, why should they look at Futura Farms and Jose Escalante? Uh, we have all the upside. But investing in Peru is not it's not a huge investment. Uh, I don't anticipate we need tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, we need a little bit of cash uh, in the bank to have peace of mind, uh, the correct orientation, uh, the right budget, and we'll, we're good to go. Uh, probably some infrastructure uh, as time passes, and we're good to go. Uh, and we are, on top of that, Raul and I are very much personally committed. We've raised capital from people that we cannot let down. Yeah. So, uh, and, and, and not only raised capital, but our families, our wives have been patient with us. And a shout out to them <laughs> uh, because they've been patient and we cannot let them down. So we are very much committed to this business and there's only one option and one outcome and that is success. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, if an investor is looking 
for one committed motherfucker, uh, here I am. Yeah. Great, great talking with you, Jose. I just have a kind of a few more questions for you. We're just going to kind of go down a more fun route. I mean, to talk a lot about politics and Futura Farms, a little bit more about Jose Escalante. Can you tell me about the first time that you tried cannabis, what it was like? It was horrible. <laughs> I, 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 actually, I, actually, I actually have two of these stories. One was my first time having cannabis, which I didn't know it, I was having cannabis. So it was uh, my oh. buddy's uh, birthday, and uh, my other buddy uh, brought some uh, space brownies, which I didn't know it was space brownies, and they were small, so I had a couple. And my and these guys told me, "What the fuck, man? Why do you do that?" I said, "I don't know. There were brownies. They were there. I, they tasted funny." I said, "Yes, they were packed with weed. You're fucked." And I started an hour an hour later. I started laughing and laughing and helping. And I was having a blast until I went into the. Um, we were like, I don't know. This guy lived with her, with his parents. So we were we were kids. Uh, and I broke down uh, a whole kitchen thing with plates and dishes and all that. Everything went to shit. <laughs> and I just had the worst trip. It was, I didn't have any, I mean, I was horrible. It was horrible. <laughs> so that was my first cannabis experience. Later on, I'll tell you the other one. Yeah, uh, yeah. That is, it, it's it's funnier. But uh, this was, uh, it was not good. I I hated it. I hated it. And uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I think you should have, to be fair, they should have told you that they were giving you cannabis. And you should. I mean, to be it. fair, to be fair, they they just brought the brownies, and I just opened them up. We were buddies, like we were on a, a, like we can just eat things. Uh, so they weren't aware. They, 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 they go, oh, no, 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 no. What the, what, what the fuck, bro? And I was, <laughs> what? <laughs> Are they like special parties or something? Yes, dude. They're filled with weed. Oh shit. No way. Yes, man. We are fucked. That's pretty It was, funny. yeah, it, I was stoned. Stone, 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 stone. <laughs> and I had no, and I had no uh, tolerance, right? So yeah, it was, it it wasn't fun. It wasn't fun. Yeah, yeah. And some of those edibles, like when you put it like over hundred milligrams, for example, it's just so powerful that you you no no or like used to cannabis. It's just way too much. And so, but actually, it's funny because you're the first person that's told me that they had a negative first experience. Um, but yeah. Anyways, moving forward, uh, these days. What is your favorite way of consuming cannabis in 2024? Uh, I think a nice joint will always be the champion. Uh, some extract uh, dabbed uh, every once in a while. It's nice for the hit. Uh, I usually uh, use vapes because it's uh, my best-selling product and it helps me a lot with my pain. I have a broken meniscus. So I usually vape a lot and we don't still have flour, like we don't sell pre-rolls in the market yet. Uh, but once we do, I'll go with that. I, I love, I love a well-rolled well joint. Yeah, awesome. Uh, last question for you, and I respect your time. Thanks for being here. Um, looking into your crystal ball, uh, knowing what Jose Escalante mm -hmm. knows, uh, what do you think is going to be the future of the cannabis industry in the next five, 10 years? And not just here in Peru, but, um, with the broader market, for example, do you think USA will be fully legalized, um, kind of reaching into Latin America? What, what, what is your projection for the next five to 10 years? Uh, I see mostly, most of Latin American countries, uh, at least medical and legal. Um, uh, probably a couple countries, including Peru and Chile, probably, no, I don't know Chile, but probably yes, uh, Colombia also. Uh, with an adult use regulation. Uh, the United States needs to be legal. I, I, I think that's that's coming in the next presidential cycle. Whether 
Trump or Harris wins, I think that's coming. It's uh, they, they can't stop it and they just have to roll with it. That's uh, why both of them said, yeah, or what the hell. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I think the U.S. will go federally legal. In the, I mean, it's still a process. It's five to ten years, right? So it's, yeah, I see it going federally legal. Markets like Europe, developing, uh, UK, France, Spain. Spain's it's a great market. Uh, Australia. I, I I think the future is bright. Uh, the market's big. Everybody smokes weed. When I went into the industry, I was stoked at how how much people smoke weed that I didn't know. <laughs> and everybody start start telling you. So everybody smokes weed. Yeah. And when time passes and people realizes it's better to sleep like a baby, they have a hangover from having too much beers. Uh, people will, will start shifting into, I think, not only cannabis, but cannabis and psychedelics. Uh, it's the next step of the of humanity. I mean, we, we had our liquor. We had, we, we're, we've been experimenting with a lot of drugs. We've already experimented. And I'm going to go deep into history, right? Like, with psychedelics uh, everywhere, we need to go back to them because we, if we mix that with the technology, of, and I'm going, I'm just flying, right? And I'm talking for only 20, 30, 50 years. We, we mix psychedelics and cannabis and, 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 and drugs with the technology of madness. We will be, we will be in Mars sooner than Elon Musk expects. Yeah. But that's just me being a fantastic thinker, right? Uh, but in the next 10 years, I think cannabis cannabis is great. We'll, we'll be fine. We'll be fine. Yeah, I love it. Completely agree, actually, with your analysis there. And I think in 10 years, when we're talking about Jose Escalante and Cucuta Farms, we're going to be talking about one of the bigger companies in Latin America for cannabis. And wow. so I think that's what we have to look forward to. What do I know? Here's you. Marketing guy, you know? Who knows what I know? Um, but th that would be my projection for you personally. But I, I think, oh, thank, thank you, you. Again, uh, for being here. Thank I definitely you. respect your time. It's been, it's been a really great discussion, very informative discussion. I've learned a lot from you. Um, just wanted to kind of uh, thank you for being here. Um, and looking forward uh, to kind of partnering with you in the future, helping each other, help each other out how we can. Um, do you have anything else you want to say? Definitely, man. Last minute? Um, thanks, man. Thanks for uh, the opportunity to chat. Uh, I'd be very open to chatting more in the future. I, I love you guys, you and Yuli. I love you guys since I met you a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I was very glad that you guys lived in Cusco. For me, it was like, what the fuck? What? I didn't know about you. That's, un that's fantastic. Let's talk more. Let's do things. Let's collaborate. Let's bring this industry up. Absolutely. And so I'll, I'll make sure to leave your link descript, LinkedIn description or LinkedIn link and also your um, a description on you and your website and the video description. But thanks again. I hope you have a great day, Jose. Talk soon. Thanks, Sam. Talk to you soon.